Good morning. My name is Pastor Pierce Frazier, and this is our worship at Morningstar Chapel in Alpharetta, Georgia, for Sunday, May 3rd, 2020. We're going to begin by opening the Lord's Word, inviting Him into our hearts and minds. We'll have a reading, I'll offer a few thoughts, and then we'll return to the Lord and close the Word. So please, Bow your heads. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Amen. Today we're beginning a series on divine providence. Divine providence. That means the Lord's governing of creation. That is, his providing for creation. It's him beginning it and guiding it. And as our text, we'll be reading from Divine Providence, work by the Lord through Emmanuel Swedenborg, written in the 18th century. You can get a copy for yourself Uh, You can go to a New Church bookstore, like newchurch.org. It's a great place to find more information. But for today, we're going to be reading from Divine Providence, number three. And as you listen to the reading, I want to invite you to consider wonder. Wonder. A sense of wonder. We'll talk more about that in a moment. from Divine Providence number three. If you will reflect deeply enough from a spiritual point of view, you will see that this prolific principle of life is not from a seed nor from the sun of the world, which is pure fire, but that it is in the seed from God the creator to whom belongs infinite wisdom. You will see that it is not present only at creation, but also continuously afterwards. For maintenance is perpetual creation, as subsistence is perpetual existence. The operation of the prolific principle in creation may be illustrated from these considerations. Work ceases if you take away will from action. Speech ceases if you deprive it of thought. Motion ceases if effort is withdrawn. In a word, The effect perishes if you remove the cause, and so on. Everything indeed in the order of creation has been endowed with power. Power, however, accomplishes nothing of itself, but only from him who has bestowed it. Now this sounds like pretty philosophical jargon in some ways, but it is making a very important point about the nature of the universe and God. There are many opinions about God, and one of the more cold ideas about God is that he is a divine creator at the beginning and then hands off. Now, we've talked before in other services about how the Lord, while he loves all of us, He does not manipulate creation arbitrarily, picking winners and losers, but that he actually works according to order. The universe, if you will, is a lawful universe. This is a a phrase I heard a physicist use, actually, that what we know about the universe is that it is lawful. It obeys certain laws. And that because it is lawful, the physicist was explaining, that it is in a sense, deterministic. Now that word, deterministic, implies that everything that has happened was predetermined. Now this is not true, but I want to invite you into a sense of wonderment at creation. I want you to consider that you are stardust. I actually mean that quite literally, stardust. 
all of the atoms that make up you or me or anyone else in the universe are one of two kinds. The first kind are the first atoms, and they are hydrogen and helium. They're very basic. Way back when, hundreds of billions of years ago, these things gathered together and they became more and more dense. And as they became more and more dense, they became hotter and reactions began to occur. These are suns, these are stars, these are furnaces. And as they slammed into each other, other atoms were created. Carbon, nitrogen, iron, all the other heavier atoms. And that over time, these stars exploded, shedding off all those atoms throughout the universe. Those atoms then also gathered together, creating the solar systems and planets that we know and think of as normal. That's the physicist's explanation for where Earth came from. All of the atoms in Earth, on Earth, all the carbon and nitrogen, oxygen and hydrogen that make up you, was created in those star furnaces. Which means you are literally made up out of stardust. That's the scientific explanation for where you come from. And isn't that a wonderment? And that over time, through laws, we came about. You can even think about your generations. Not only are the atoms that you're made out of hundreds of billions of years old, but that you come from a person who had a mother, who had a mother, who had another mother. And if you go back far enough, you could go back 100,000 years to a mother in a cave somewhere in Europe or in the Middle East. And that that could be your mother. It is an astounding idea. The wonderment of it all. Now, deterministic creation suggests that after the Big Bang, there was an explosion of material, hydrogen and helium gathered together, and more stars exploded and the dust gathered, but that all of it, after that initial explosion, was pretty much determined. That while there is wiggle room at the subatomic level, that it all averages out. And then on the macro level, at the atomic and greater on the molecular level, things happen the way they happen. Now this matters because our brains are made up of molecules. And they might be deterministic too. Is that how God created the universe? By setting something in motion, being a being outside of time and space, and pushing it forward and then hands off. Is that the universe? Now that is what I like to consider a cold idea of God. Now there are two reasons why I like to think of it as cold. The first is that it seems kind of cold. I like to believe in a divine being who loves me, and love is warm. If instead it's merely a clockmaker, who sets a machine in motion and then his hands off, there's no love in that. That seems cold. A cold father is someone who has children but never gets involved in their life, is absent, cold. So that's one wa reason why I call, call this the cold concept of creation. The other one is because it leads to a cold end. What we know, again from physics, is that energy dissipates, that the universe grows cold, literally. That as it ages, it grows cold. And that in theory, it ends. It is a principle of the natural world that everything ends. That's what our reading was talking about. It was saying that everything ends. 
that without the thing that moves it, the thing that is moved eventually stops. Objects in motion do not continue. They do eventually stop. That's what entropy is describing. And yet, a part of us sees the opposite of entropy. Another way of thinking of entropy is that things become more and more chaotic, fall apart. You can see entropy in your house as just every year you need to donate or uh, dedicate one to two percent of your house's value just in upkeep. Otherwise, the roof will fall apart, weeds will crawl in. You can actually see this in the world around you. If a building isn't in use, even like an office building, for a few weeks, rats will move in, plants will start to cre creep towards it. In a few years, plants will begin to take over. Nature will tear that constructed thing apart. But what's more, over a longer time, anything that's built will be torn apart. Order crumbles. And yet, look around you. Life, us. We are an amazing amalgamation of ordered parts. That all of this works is just a wonderment. We're not falling apart. Now, in some sense, we're falling apart. Being older, I definitely feel older. I feel like I'm falling apart. And yet, I am more me than I have ever been. Even the things I do not remember, they are still a part of me. I grow, I change, I thrive. Now these are observations. Let me read the next part of Divine Providence and let's continue our examination of wonder. Examine also any other object on the earth as a silkworm, a bee, or any other tiny creature. And view if you're first naturally, afterwards rationally, and finally spiritually. Then if you can raise your thoughts to a high level, you will be astonished at all you perceive. And if you permit wisdom to speak in you, you might say in astonishment, who does not see the divine in these things? They are all the work of divine wisdom. Still more will this be the case if you observe the uses of all the things which have been created, noting how they proceed in their own order right up to mankind and from humanity back to the creator from whom they are. And from that conjunction of the creator with humanity, the conjunction of all things depends. And if you will acknowledge it, the preservation of all things. It will be seen in what follows that the divine love created all things and did nothing without that divine wisdom. Consider that for a moment. I don't know if you noticed that, but sort of in the middle, it was talking about how if you observe the natural world, you'll be amazed, just naturally, at how amazing it is. You'll just say, whoa, look at those colors, it's beautiful. But if you raise your mind a little bit higher into a rational light, you'll begin to see all the amazing scientific truths about this natural world. But that if you raise your mind even higher to a spiritual light, you will begin to see the divine order in it, and specifically the use of it. That's the word, use. Now, in regular science, there's not a lot of discussion about the purpose of something. Now, sometimes they speak as if things have a purpose. Like, they might say in biology that uh, an organism is created in order to do certain things. But strictly speaking, in scientific terms, nothing was created in order to do another thing. It just happened to be that way. That's that random, willless, cold determinism. And yet, we humans cannot but add into the way we talk about things a desire, a want, a canatus, 
a willing on the part of things. We speak about it when we speak about evolution, when we speak about even physics. But it's not because we're being foolish, but because we have in us an innate sense that things do have a use, a purpose. And that purpose was communicated to us. The universe is not created randomly. It's created with a purpose. And that purpose is to reconnect with the God, to reconnect with the Lord. Imagine for your moment a being. This being is infinitely loving. And that that quality is the most central, essential thing about that being more important than any other detail. And that love is a thing, not a substance, but that what makes love love follows certain rules. Love, real love, wills to love something outside of itself. Otherwise, it is not love, but selfishness. Love wills to join with that thing outside of itself, and to make that thing blessed or happy. That's what love wants. And we can see this in our own lives. Real love is seeing another person, wanting to be one with them, shake their hands, give them a hug, be in community with them in a congregation, in a family, in a marriage, in a friendship, and to bring joy and blessings on that other person. Well, that's our finite, limited love. God has infinite love. He is all loving, which means the number of people he could love is indefinite, unending. So this being creates universe, the universe so that he may love us. And he needs an indefinite number of us a number that continually expands. And so the universe is massive with an unending potential for life, for beings who can return God's love. And isn't that amazing? That's the purpose of creation. And from that, that's the meaning of life. This is not something that you can discover by science. Science can help you appreciate the wonderment of the universe. But it will be an article not so much of faith, but of love. I said at the beginning how I don't want to believe in a cold God. That want to believe is central. Who we are, who I am, who anyone is, at the essential, most important part, is what they want, what they love. And I love the idea of a warm God. It's why I believe in God. It's why I believe that God is human, that he loves us, that he is involved. As I look around at creation, I am amazed. I am humbled that there is order in it, and that in that order, I see a continual guidance of the Lord in his love. I do not feel cold. When I see scientific principles working according to the way they should, when things work because I expect them to, I feel the Lord's love when I remember to. And that's the trick when we remember to. I forget all the time, and I'm sure some of you forget as well. But then, isn't that the use of the Sabbath? To remember the Lord, and that he created everything, that he may give us joy. So, I invite you to try and remember the Lord in prayer, in blessings, in song, and in life. When you look out at the world, Invite that wonderment and remember the Lord. And that in every detail, his love may be seen. 
Now, will you please join me in prayer to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your creation, for your word, for your instruction, for your truth, and for your light, and most of all, for your love. Help us remember your love. Help us to see the love you have for us in the lawfulness and order of your universe. And help us be a part of it. Help us be people who work to share love, who create and not destroy, who live according to the light, that we may bless one another as you surely bless us. Now hear the words of prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Let us know what you think. What wonder do you see in creation? How have you seen the Lord's love in your life? And how have you been able to share it with others? Thank you for joining us.